All right, so classical conditioning. Let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, we're going over learning today. So learning is unit six in the AP Psych book. Uh, on this digital learning day, we're kind of going back and reviewing chapter nine from regular psych, which was also about learning. Uh, three things we're going to really try to get to today. We're going to try to cover classical conditioning. We're going to try to cover operant conditioning. And then we're going to get a little bit to social learning. So first off, classical conditioning, what is it? It's when we take a once neutral stimulus, combine it with a natural or what we call an unconditioned stimulus so many times that we actually form a response or react to that once neutral stimulus and make it a conditioned stimulus. So lightning and thunder example. We know that thunder always follows lightning. So if we are naturally scared of thunder, you know, when it booms, we kind of become scared and maybe we wince. And we know that lightning always comes before thunder. We may form a response to lightning, even though that's not exactly what scares us. And before, we weren't scared of lightning. It's the fact that we know lightning is associated with thunder. That's the reason we respond to it. Okay, so that's classical conditioning in a nutshell. Uh, we're also going to talk about operant conditioning today. Uh, operant conditioning is very simple, learning from consequences. If you do something good and get rewarded for it, you're more likely to repeat that behavior in the future. You do something and get punished for it, less likely to repeat that behavior in the future. But let's focus on classical conditioning first. All right, classic example here. Like we always all remember this. This is Pavlov's dog's example. The father of classical conditioning, Ivan Pavlov, who is a Russian physiologist, was studying salivation one day and its role in digestion, you know, what role saliva played in digestion. And uh, he started uh, his experiment out every day by ringing a tuning fork. And that alerted the dog that it was about to get food. And uh, of course, any time the dog knew that it was going to get food, it started to salivate. Well, what we found out was once we paired this tuning fork sound with food time and time and time again, the dog started to salivate just at the sound of the tuning fork, even without any food present. So Pavlov kind of stumbles upon this idea of classical conditioning. Um, now let's take a more outside the box example. Let's say something that is natural, like a kiss bringing on romantic arousal. You see the U.S. up there and the U.R. That stands for unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response. Um, a kiss naturally brings about romantic arousal. Uh, let's say we paired it with a neutral stimulus like, oh, uh, let's say onion breath. If you take onion breath and pair it with a kiss, which is naturally going to bring about romantic arousal, if you pair it enough times, then you may get, yes, you guessed it, onion breath bringing on romantic arousal. Now, let's keep two things in mind here, okay? Two word associations we did back in Psych 1. Remember, unconditioned equals natural, conditioned equals learned. That is something we definitely want to keep in, in mind, uh, even from Psych 1, moving on here to uh, do some classical conditioning examples. Um, next one is a couple of things that go along with classical conditioning. First is extinction. Uh, let's go back to Pavlov's dogs, for example. If after the dog has become conditioned to respond to that tuning fork, which means every time it hears the tuning fork, it, it starts to uh, salivate. If we went to a method where we started to ring that tuning fork and presented no food after and continued to do that, the response would become extinct, which means the dog would no longer salivate at the sound of the tuning fork because it no longer associates the two. So that's what happens with extinction. Now, spontaneous recovery also can happen. What spontaneous recovery is, is when that condition response actually comes back. So after a period of extinction, spontaneous recovery actually brings the conditioned response back. So, you know, years down the line, if a dog heard a tuning fork, maybe it starts to slightly salivate because it remembers back to the time that it would have got food uh, when, it's heard, when it heard the tuning fork. So those are two. Another two uh, examples are generalization and discrimination. Generalization is the basically acting or responding to two similar stimuli that are different, but they're similar in the same way. Okay, so if you remember back to Psych 1, my example here was uh, you know, a dog that I have at home, uh, old Bert. Okay, Bert, like most dogs, would uh, bark and run to the door every time he heard the doorbell. Okay, that is a classical conditioning example there. He knows that the doorbell from previous experience means somebody's at the door, which naturally makes him bark. Um, so generalization is when... Bert would also hear our microwave go off, and it makes kind of a similar sound to our doorbell. It's definitely different, but it's similar. And uh, every time he heard the microwave go off, he would go running to the door, okay? Uh, and then uh, discrimination is the exact opposite. Discrimination is being able to uh, differentiate between those two sounds. Even though they may be similar, 
you know, I have two dogs, and my uh, my more intelligent dog discriminates. Uh, that dog knows that when the uh, microwave goes off, that is not the same thing as the doorbell ringing, and it does not mean that somebody is at the door. Uh, so discrimination is the opposite of generalization. John Watson and Baby Albert, this is a great example that you got to know from your textbook. John Watson uh, did some classical conditioning uh, experiments himself. One of his most famous was the Baby Albert ex uh, experiment, where he had the little six-month-old Baby Albert, and he showed him a white fluffy rabbit. And Baby Albert loved the rabbit, you know, went out to pet it and touch it. And John Watson wanted to see if he could condition fear in this young child of a rabbit. So the next time he got the rabbit out, as Baby Albert reached out to touch the rabbit, John Watson and his assistant banged together pots and pans right behind Baby Albert's head. And Baby Albert was immediately fearful um, because of the loud noise. So after that, he associated that white rabbit with the loud noise, and he became scared anytime he saw the white rabbit. Not only that, he generalized his fear. Anytime after that that we presented Albert with anything that was white and fluffy, he became scared. Whether it was the white beard of a Santa mask or whether it was a white stuffed animal rabbit, even though it wasn't a real rabbit, he was scared of all of them. He had generalized his fear. So I thought maybe I could do something similar. So with the help of a Nerf gun and my five-year-old son Wyatt and a sound effect from my phone, I wanted to see if I could pull off my own classical conditioning example and uh, make Wyatt cringe in fear at the sound of my little sound effect on my phone. So after a few trials, it actually worked. Uh, so I'll let you take a look at this. Alright, so there you go. My own uh, little homemade classical conditioning example. Don't worry about Wyatt. He's doing fine. Uh, he's uh, adjusting quite well from his uh, emotional battle with the Nerf gun. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to operant conditioning. Okay, operant conditioning, learning from consequences. Okay, so a fairly easy concept here, popularized by B.F. Skinner, who is the father of operant conditioning. Uh, he had his operant chamber, some people call it a Skinner box, where he shaped a mouse's or a rat's behavior to push down a bar to get food, which in this case was obviously the reinforcement. Um, shaping is actually the process that B.F. Skinner followed to get that rat to push down the bar. Obviously, the rat's not going to push down the bar the first time. You can't teach a rat to do something that far out of its regular nature just in one step. So he had to shape the rat's behavior. So what shaping is, is basically rewarding any response that gets him closer and closer to the desired behavior. In Psych 1, I made the example, when you teach a dog to do a trick, this is what you're doing. You teach a dog to roll over, it's not going to roll over the first time. you got to reward it at different points along the way as it gets closer and closer to doing the desired behavior. Um, so first off, reinforcement. Reinforcement means we are trying to increase the behavior. So anytime you see the word reinforcement, know that we're trying to increase the behavior. Even if it's negative reinforcement, we're trying to increase the behavior. So positive reinforcement is when we give something positive. You can see the examples there, getting a hug or receiving a paycheck. And uh, negative reinforcement is when we remove something bad. So uh, it uses here in the little graphic here, the example that I gave you in Psych 1, fastening your seatbelt in the car to make that annoying beeping go off. Once you do the desired behavior, the annoying thing, the negative thing goes away, therefore increasing the likelihood you're going to do that in the future. Put your seatbelt on, okay? Uh, and then we also have... Um, something new here, okay? Edward Thorndike is not somebody we talked about in Psych 1. This is completely new. It's Edward Thorndike's law of effect, saying that favorable consequences become more likely and behaviors followed by unfavorable consequences become less likely. So if you do something that brings along a favorable consequence, you're going to be more likely to do that thing in the future. If you do something that brings along a unfavorable or negative consequence, it's going to become less likely. He found that out when he put uh, cats in this little makeshift box, you see, 
at the uh, bottom right hand corner. He put them in the box and the cats had to do a very simple two step method to get out of the box. He would, they, they would have to unlock the door and then push up this pulley system to get the door to come open so they could escape. And what he found with each attempt in the box, the cats got quicker and quicker uh, with how they could get out of the box because they returned those methods that they found successful in the past. So Edward Thorndike's law of effect uh, is noted right there. Um, schedules of reinforcement, this is big too, okay? How often and how regularly and when you can predict reinforcement coming affects how it's going to affect your learning or behavior. So uh, let's go through the chart here real quick. You have fixed and variable, and then you have ratio and interval. Let's remember another word association we had from Psych 1. Ratio equals number, interval equals time. So when you're at a fixed ratio, that means you are going to get reinforced at a fixed time, or sorry, a fixed number every time. So, uh, you know, if you buy three coffees and get one free, or buy ten coffees and get one free, like it says here, that's a fixed ratio. You know when it's coming. You know when you buy that tenth coffee, you're getting one free. Variable, variable ratio is not predictable. You cannot predict it. It's like the lottery. You know that if you buy enough lottery tickets, you're going to eventually win. You just never know when that reinforcement winning the lottery is going to come. Okay. Uh, interval has to do with time. So if I get paid every two weeks, okay, that would be a fixed interval. I know no matter how much I work, I'm going to get paid every two weeks. That's on a time schedule, and it's fixed. It's predictable. And then unpredictable is uh, a variable interval, which means I know I'm going to get the payoff or going to get reinforced at a, a specific amount of time. I just don't know when the time is going to come. Okay. Um, positive punishment and negative punishment. These are ways to decrease behavior. So positive punishment comes about by me adding something bad. You know, if a kid does something bad and they get spanked, that is adding something bad. It's going to decrease that behavior. Negative punishment is taking away something good. So you do something bad and mom or dad takes away your cell phone. That's negative punishment. Um, now learning by observation. Now this is what we call social learning. Social or observational learning takes place when we watch people do things and uh, we learn from it or even mimic it. Modeling is actually a type of observational learning. Modeling is observing and imitating behavior. We see somebody do something, and uh, usually they get a desirable response. Then we mimic the behavior. We model it. Uh, here's something new as well, new slide here, uh, something we didn't talk about in Psych 1, the difference between intrinsic and e extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic is a desire to perform behavior correctly for its own sake. Like, we're internally motivated to do that. Uh, it doesn't come from anything from the outside. No reward can strengthen this. It is all internal motivation. Extrinsic motivation means that you want to get a reward or avoid a punishment for doing something. So, you know, people who become really, really good basketball players, you know, say like all-time greats, probably have a great deal of intrinsic motivation. No amount of external praise or paychecks or anything can make them do any better. It's an internal desire to be great. At, at extrinsic motivation may be those you know, players who maybe don't make it at the professional level because their motivation comes from a shoe contract or a paycheck or a new deal. Like all these things are external things that motivate you. Uh, oh, and obviously Albert Bandura and his Bobo doll experiment is the most famous case for social learning. If you remember this, you had uh, the Bobo doll that was modeled to be beat up by an adult and kids were actually watching this adult model as she punched the Bobo doll in the face, threw him up in the air, pushed him down, hit him with a hammer, kicked him in the air, and then when we let the kids in the room, they did the exact same thing. Uh, so it shows the power of modeling and the power of social learning that these kids exhibited the exact same behaviors that the adult uh, was shown to exhibit. And then the last thing here, applications of observational learning. There are obviously positive ways that we can use modeling and social learning. I mean, if you see somebody help somebody on the side of the road by helping them fix their tire or fix a flat tire, and you're more likely to help somebody when you see them, that's a pro-social effect. That's a positive effect on behavior. But there's also what we call antisocial effects. Antisocial effects would be probably what's shown in the picture here. You know, uh, a few kids who have probably watched a little bit too much WWF wrestling, what happens? They model that behavior, and obviously it is not positive. It is a negative thing. So that's the quick little presentation on learning. Uh, hopefully you got this done quick and uh, enjoyed it. And uh, one last thought on uh, Digital Learning Day. Here you go. Social.